Good morning and welcome back to Advanced English Conversation with Professor Kent Lee. Today we are going to talk about sexual exploitation in advertising. We talked about fallacies and in this section we're going to talk about sexual ex exploitation, the use of sex in advertising. Uh, these are um, some things I've asked you to talk about in your uh, past minor assignment, either an uh, example of logical fallacy or uh, use of um, sexual exploitation or discrimination in advertising or media. And we are going to actually continue that for the midterm. For the midterm, you're going to expand on this and create a uh, kind of a uh, sort of a solo presentation. You'll be recording it at your home, I guess, and submitting it through the LMS. So uh, if you can, you can go to the website and there's more of a description of topics for the midterm, but it's kind of based on your last assignment. So since we've talked about fallacies in advertising, we looked at a few examples. On the last example, one of the last examples that we discussed in the previous video actually involves sexualization. Uh, in that case, a deliberate and also kind of a, a humorous uh, um, exploitation of male sexuality, uh, presenting a, a male athlete as a sexual object uh, to appeal to the ladies as well as to the men. So we'll talk more generally about sexual exploitation in advertising. In advertising, they say that sex sells, and it does. So. Uh, we're going to talk about exploitation and objectification. So objectification refers to using people as objects. Uh, for example, using people as sexual objects. Uh, sexualization refers to um, making it so that one's, a person's value derives from, comes from their sexual appearance or their sexual behavior. And it goes along with uh, sexual objectification. So, we know that uh, sex sells and sex in advertising works. Uh, as long as humans have physical bodies, it's always going to be the case. Um, does that mean we shouldn't do anything um, to maybe prevent some of it? Um, well, I think that we can, as a society, as a culture, do something. Um, well, maybe talk a little bit about that or maybe I'll have you talk about that if you choose a topic like this for your midterm. But let's understand today why. Uh, why is uh, sexuality used in advertising and doesn't have any negative effects? So first question, why do advertisers use sexuality in advertising? They of course obviously exploit women a lot. Uh, occasionally they exploit men, male sexuality. Uh, I probably they might have a sense that it's either wrong or that some people will object to it, but nonetheless, this happens a lot. So why does it happen? Why do advertisers use sexuality in advertising? Why do they exploit people, especially women, in advertising? Why do they use sex in advertising? Why? Why does it work? Why is it effective? Why is it used? I want you to pause the video for a few minutes and talk about this with somebody. Okay, we're back. Uh, first reason, I'll just list a few reasons that come to my mind. This is not an exhaustive or a complete list of reasons, but a few reasons that come to my mind. Getting attention in advertisement, with, for example, that uses uh, sexually attractive women, women dressed attractively, uh, dressed uh, in a more sexualized manner, it obviously gets our attention. Uh, it gets people's attention. Um, men notice it, but women do too, of course. Everyone notices it. And if it gets your attention, that's one of the first goals of advertisers because we are flooded with a lot of advertising messages and it's hard just to get people to notice an advertisement. Uh, and so a sexual image is obviously going to attract attention and get noticed more likely than other adverts. Uh, it creates obviously a positive association with the product. Uh, those who 
um, for example, find the image attractive, are going to have a positive image of the product in their minds, are going to have a positive association with the product, and that can then um, create some implications. It might imply, for example, that this product will make you successful, this product will make you attractive, uh, this product will make you maybe attractive like that person, or this product will make you attractive or successful so that um, beautiful people like that might like you. Um, so it appeals to your desire, maybe your desire for sex appeal. You want to be successful and attract people like that, perhaps. Uh, so it's kind of like the ad populum fallacies where you um, appeal to emotional appeal. This is not really an emotional appeal, though. This is kind of deeper than an emotional appeal. It's an appeal to more animal instincts. So here we're using sex and advertising itself is not necessarily a logical fallacy, although it can overlap with maybe an ad populum fallacy too, but in itself it's a different kind of thing. It's, uh, it's an appeal to deeper kinds of psychological and biological impulses, the obvious biological impulses, but also psychological impulses, your need for self-worth, your, your desire, your you know, desires, your interests, um, your needs and your maybe your desire or your need to be attractive and meet uh, and attract attractive people like those in the advert, perhaps. Um, of course, memory. It sticks in your mind. Those images stick in your mind uh, and it makes the product stick in your mind. Uh, so it's obviously more memorable. Uh, it, people remember your product, your, adver your advertisements better. We're not going to forget the Old Spice commercials if we've seen them, as silly as they are or kind of, a, we say, over-the-top silly, kind of excessively silly, um, kind of non-realistic, and it's deliberately so. It combines these non-realistic elements with the sexual imagery, and you're not going to forget it. Even if you think that Old Spice, Old Spice smells absolutely disgusting, as I do, you're not going to forget it. It sticks in your mind. And uh, you have at least a more positive impression of Old Spice, even though you hate the smell, as I do. Uh, I would never use it. I don't want people to smell me from like, you know, 50 meters away. Another reason, of course, is people are exposed today to more sexual imagery through the internet. Uh, so advertisers have a uh, few more of a desire to compete with that. And, and so they uh, today use even more sexual imagery, more sexual exploitation. Maybe they go further with exploitation than they did 20 or 40 years ago. They definitely do. Because they're competing with the fact that you can easily see so much sexual imagery on the internet, in other media, uh, and they're competing with that. So this is all pushing the envelope. Uh, we say pushing the envelope. Imagine if you're putting money in an envelope to give to somebody. You want to like buy their favor. Um, so we speak of something that's, you're pushing the, the moral boundaries or the limits of what's acceptable by saying pushing the envelope. It's like you're pushing the envelope toward the person you're giving the money to. Uh, it's become a metaphor in English, an idiom, meaning you're kind of pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable, what is socially accepted. Uh, and of course, more, me more media does this, whether it's sexuality or violence or other kinds of content. Uh, more and more media pushing, are pushing the envelope, advertisers too. More and more they push the envelope with uh, uh, ever increasing amounts of sexual exploitation in the media. So, does this have any problems when advertisers use sexuality to sell products? Uh, and again, it's mostly women, women's bodies are used, but sometimes men's, or in a different way, men are in a different way exploited, but of course by and large it's targeted uh, to women. Does this have any negative effects on people or on society? What negative effects does it have when advertising sexualizes women and exploits women for advertising? Discuss this for a few minutes. Pause the video and talk for a while.
Okay, we're back and let's talk about problems of sexualization in advertising. On the website I'll put a link to a nice kind of report that summarizes a lot of the research in psychology and advertising studies and related fields about this. But first let's talk about perceptions of women. Uh, not only how women what could be how women perceive themselves and their roles in society, uh, but especially men's perceptions of women and men's expectations of women. Uh, first of all, of course, exploiting women uh, naturally teaches um, people that women are objects that can be used for um, satisfying one's desires, including sexual desires, as well as maybe other purposes, too, that they are objects to be used for your own happiness or your own sexual desires. Sexualizing women especially women, uh, uh, it makes them so, so that their value as people uh, is not really based on their value as people, not like men. Their value then comes from their sexual appearance or their behavior or their sexual, sexual usefulness to you, to the person. Um, it affects how people perceive women and their competence and their value or morality. So do you perceive when you see women uh, dressed uh, with little clothing, do you perceive them as competent? No. You, you see them as objects, not as competent human pe beings, not as intelligent beings, po possibly as intelligent as you. You, know, you don't see them for value bes besides their sexual value or uh, utility value, their usefulness for, what, for you per personally, uh, their worth and morality. You're even less likely to perceive them as moral agents as moral people, maybe people with moral values as you. Uh, you're more likely to see them as people with lower standards of morality. Uh, so this affects people's perceptions of women and their expectations of women. Um, it affects men's expectations and it also expects, influences women's perceptions and expectations of themselves too. And there's research that shows all of this, by the way. Uh, so these kinds of advertisements, especially with when showing women, women portray them as passive or weak or even childlike. Uh, and these are, of course, not good roles for, especially for children who are watching the advertisements. Uh, <clears throat> men are treated as active, uh, even aggressive, and it's treated as okay. Uh, it even promotes male dominance over women. Um, women are um, supposed to be passive, submissive, secondary. Um, this reinforces traditional gender roles or sex roles, where male men are dominant, females are submissive and secondary. Men are the more active people in society, in the workplace, and women have a secondary role. Supposedly, um, their value is maybe cooking and cleaning and um, serving as uh, objects for personal or sexual gratification, not as meaningful members of society who can be doctors and engineers and scholars um, or CEOs like us guys. Naturally, this leads to body image and body, body problems, body image problems especially. Again, there is research showing this. It reinforces, promotes false ideas about women's body shape, that women are supposed to be thin, and yet they're supposed to have, and yet they're supposed to be very shapely. These are sometimes contradictory body images or expectations. Uh, so it uh, makes people have really unreal, unrealistic ex uh, ideas of how thin women should be. And obviously, too thin is not healthy. There are negative health effects of being too thin, uh, just physical health effects. If you're thin for a long time, uh, um, you are setting yourself up for health problems later on in life. It makes women more self-conscious of their bodies, and this leads to various, it can potentially contribute to dis, uh, eating disorders, uh, lower self-confidence, lower self-esteem, uh, it makes people more self-conscious. It makes people unsatisfied with their bodies. This promotes bodily dis dissatisfaction where women especially are not satisfied with their bodies and they view themselves as fat when they are not. They view themselves as unattractive when they are not. 
They view themselves as ugly when they are not. So this leads to, of course, things like wrong expectations about how women should look. Uh, and the younger ones are more valued and things like that. Um, this can lead to body image problems for men too. When men are portrayed as better when they are, you know, more macho looking and um, look like the guy in the old Spice commercial, um, men can have similar body problem, body image problems too, uh, or um, feel a lack of self-confidence about their worth and value because they don't meet some kind of a, a stereotype male image. So advertisements promote st stereotypes about men and women. Uh, and research has shown that these advertising images um, maybe, maybe directly or indirectly uh, lead to more of an, among men and women, lead to more of an acceptance of exploitation of women, that it's more okay to exploit women, harassment of women, discrimination against women, uh, violence against women, even sexual violence against women. Uh, so it makes men more accepting of these kinds of wrong behaviors and it makes, and it uh, also makes uh, or leads women to be more accepting of such inappropriate behavior towards women, including themselves. And again, there is research out there showing that it may not necessarily be a very direct link, but it is a very real effect that these advertising images over time have on men and women's perceptions of themselves, of each other, and especially women's roles. Uh, this, of course, leads to sexism, sexist attitudes towards women, ageism, because again, it's usually the younger women that are preferred, the younger appearance, uh, are, uh, younger looking women are preferred in these advertising images. And the, a term you sometimes hear is lookism, that is sometimes used, I think, in some of the research on um, these kinds of social attitudes. They use the term lookism. Uh, so valuing people because of their appearance, not because of their worth or their intelligence or their, uh, their, their moral or personal uh, virtues and their value as a person, but judging people based on appearances. Uh, again, this leads to men's, it can cause men to have uh, also to have self-perception problems. Uh, if I don't look like that, I won't, I'll be a loser. I won't get women like that or, uh, gee, I can't attract, uh, women. There must be something wrong with me. Uh, there are gray areas. So moral gray areas too. Uh, by the way, sometimes I think a lot of the times it's clear, um, that advertisements are sexualizing women. Many times that's clear. Uh, occasionally people might complain about a particular advertising image and the advertisers might say, well, it empowers women. It treats women as sexually taking the lead and being more sexually aggressive and being more sexually equal. Uh, that might be true sometimes, but sometimes it's an excuse uh, for actually exploiting women. Uh, but sometimes there is a gray area. And maybe you can think of some examples. Gray areas where certain maybe uh, advertisements or more often in media, TV shows and movies where the woman is uh, maybe more sexually aggressive. Um, is it devaluing women, making the women a sex object? Uh, or are there sometimes when it empowers women, give, it gives the women more power? Um, I think probably most of the time it's exploiting women, but there are probably some times where it's a gray area. Uh, and there's an argument to be made where, where certain forms of media are maybe at the same time devaluing, sexualizing, and empowering women. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell. One area of controversy is PETA advertisements, so People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, the animal rights organization, is famous for using pictures of people, especially women, especially celebrities in their advertisements who are um, dressed scantily, few clothes, or nude. Um, and again, more often this is done with female celebrities, female actresses, and famous people. And, and again, they're trying to make a point um, that uh, about how we treat animals 
is maybe sometimes a double standard. If you treated people like that, how would it be? Uh, and I can see their point, but at the same time, they have been criticized, especially by feminists, for sexually exploiting women. It's just sexual, sexual exploitation of women. You're not really, they, they might say, you're not really making your point a moral argument. You're exploiting women too. Um, so those PETA ads have been controversial. What do you think about that? Oh, those advertisements, are they fair? Are they exploiting women in a bad way? Is there justification for how they are portraying people, especially women, uh, in making a point about animal rights? Finally, let's talk about solutions. Are there solutions to this? Um, and it, of course, may not be a good ad idea to advocate for government censorship. There are a lot of moral problems or ethical problems with that. But beyond simplistic solutions like censorship, uh, are there some ways that we as a society can maybe at least limit this problem? And of course, I don't mean that we can make it go away. That's never going to happen, obviously. But is there something that as a society or in business uh, that can be done to maybe improve the situation? I'll let you think about that. What would be some specific solutions? If you think about solutions, don't, anybody could say, well, people need to be more aware of this. Well, yeah, of course. That's why I'm doing this video. Yeah, we need to be more aware of that. That's one important step. Um, that's obvious. Uh, what are some other specific ways we can increase education and public awareness about this? What are ways we can reach the business community, advertising companies, those who are maybe studying now to in college to go into advertising jobs and work as advertisers. What are some way, what are some specific practical things we can do? So if you want to think about this and if you if this is something you want to do for your midterm topic, it you don't have to, but if you want to talk about solutions, just some guidelines. They should be sensible. You don't know, talk about censorship, government censoring advertisements. That's not gonna work. Uh, that's crazy. It's illegal. Uh, it's not ethical to censor things. But besides that, what are some practical, sensible, and effective things that could be done? Um, uh, there might be some other things we could do in terms of government policy or um, uh, other kinds of policies or in terms of education. But think of some specific, practical, and effective ideas. They should be feasible. Feasible means you can do it. It would be possible to actually implement it. If it's specific and practical and effective enough that you could actually see, oh, we could implement it like this. We could do it. Uh, it could actually be put into practice. It's manageable. It's doable. Uh, so think about that. that. Those are some things you might want to think about if you want to do, do a topic like this, if you wish to choose um, an option like this for your midterm presentation. So I'll leave you with that. What would be some ways of addressing this problem? Some practical ways of improving the situation. You can think about that. And until then, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.